Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and today I'm going to teach you how I make pathology videos for my YouTube channel. Uh, probably most of you will not care about this, and if you're not interested in making videos, then you can stop watching now. Uh, but for the few of you that have asked me, how do you make these videos, um, it did take me a little while to learn. It's actually not very hard, but I went through and made a step-by-step -step tutorial here showing you the different ways that I make videos. So many of my videos are made with uh, glass slides at the microscope, and that's the first method I'm going to teach you. And then the other thing I'm going to teach you is how to do um, screen recording on um, a MacBook. Now, I only use a MacBook, so that's really all I know. I'm sure that there are ways to do screen recording and screen capture with Windows. I've used um, some things before, like Camtasia, but it's been a long time since I've used them, and I don't really know how anymore. So um, I'm just showing you the way that I do it. And um, as you'll see, I am definitely not a video expert. I'm not an expert at making videos or editing them. Um, and when I first started doing it, I wanted them to be totally perfect. And if you go back to the very beginning of my YouTube channel, back in 2012, 2013, you'll see a couple of videos that I made that I talk slowly, I don't stumble over my words, and that's because I edited out every little um, and I made a script, and I memorized it, or, or studied it really a lot, and I added little subtitles, and it took a lot of work. And I gave up on making videos for several years, uh, because it was just too intensive on my time. And uh, the, the reason I'm telling this story is because I think it's really important to realize that um, unless you really have a passion for video editing, uh, it can consume you and take up way more time than you have. Uh, and uh, I think that perfect is the enemy of good. It's such an important uh, phrase that people have said. And I think it really applies here that I was trying to be so perfect that I just gave up and got discouraged. And one of my um, former medical students, who's now a resident, Dr. Mickey Lindsay, uh, she said, will you please make this? I've been talking about making a skin histology video. And she said, uh, back when she was about to start my second year med school course on skin and bone and soft tissue, she said, will you please make a skin histology video? And I said, okay, fine, Mickey, I'll do it. And I made the video and I just kind of made it raw. I pulled some slides, sat down at the scope. There were some residents and students there and I recorded an hour and 15 minutes of uh, video. And I just left all the ums and everything in. One of the med students helped edit it because I didn't know how to edit back then. And everyone loved it and they didn't care that I said um and that I talked fast and stumbled over my words. So it, that left that be a lesson to you that's now the most watched video on my channel actually so uh, that's when I realized oh I should just make more videos and not worry about making them perfect just just put the content out there and really and again I'm, I'm gonna preach at you a little bit but the reason that I'm so passionate about this is when I started making these videos people from all over the world said please 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 make more pathology videos and get other pathologists uh, in your country to make videos because where we live in our part of the world there's not access to teaching like this we don't have uh, experts to sit at the microscope and teach us and we have to figure it out by talking with residents or learning from books so it really opened my eyes because I've always in my training had had attending sit for hours at the scope and teach me one-on-one -on -one with slides and th which is the way I make my videos basically I it's like sitting next to me at the microscope uh, I was shocked to realize that there are a lot of people in programs, some here in the United States, but also around the world, there's varying quality of uh, pathology education and many pathologists do not have the luxury of having someone teach them in great detail. They try to get access to books, but books are expensive and they may not have the newest version. Uh, many journals, the articles are behind paywalls, and if you're from uh, a developing country with low, uh, low income, you can't afford to pay $35 per article. So giving free videos uh, via YouTube is an amazing way, I think, to kind of contribute to the global pathology community and help educate our colleagues who have, um, have maybe less experience, less access, less money, whatever it is, uh, who don't have as much as we have. Uh, at least that's the way I look at it. So this is my way to kind of try to help other people around the world because it's not just helping colleagues, it's helping them take care of their patients, right? Um, even if they don't have access to tr training and teaching or immunostains and molecular like I do, guess what? They still have to take care of sick people even though they don't have all the tools that I have at my fingertips. That's very moving to me and really has inspired me to do more and it's when I started traveling to other parts of the world and people said, your Twitter and Facebook, that's all great, cool, but please make more videos and please get other people to make videos. So I'm hoping that this video will inspire you to do that and uh, let you realize why it's important to do that and also teach you the technical details of how. And if you feel nervous, you know, I um, talk a lot and I talk in front of big crowds of people a lot. I give lectures all the time and I don't feel very nervous anymore, but I still feel a little bit nervous when I record 
videos. I still don't exactly understand why. My wife's a psychiatrist. Maybe she can figure that out. Uh, she really is a psychiatrist, actually. Um, I don't understand why. A video recording, um, I can edit it if I make a mistake. It's not live. But I don't know. Maybe it's that I don't have that instant feedback from the audience, which is really important to me when I give talks to kind of see how the audience is responding. Also, it feels weird to just talk to a camera. So um, if you struggle with that, uh, you can, a couple things you can do. Number one, if you have a multi-headed microscope or if you have a big screen, have some students sit there with you and you can either have them just sit and observe quietly, which is usually I think what they want to do. Um, or if you have a more um, interactive student that wants to do like an interactive session with you and, you know, do questions and answers, I think that's a really fun format. A lot of trainees are probably uncomfortable with that because they don't want to feel stupid or, or, you know, look like they don't know anything online. But if they uh, feel that way, you can direct them to some of my videos, uh, like the one I made with Dr. Jeanette Ramos about um, uh, heme path board review, uh, looking at peripheral blood smears. And you can see with me as the student and her as the teacher, just how little I know about peripheral blood smears. I've learned a little bit more after doing that session with her, but I think the interactive format's really fun and it's okay to not know everything. It's okay in training to not know all the answers. And uh, I think in some ways that helps inspire other people because it shows them that you know, we all have stuff that we don't know. We all have knowledge gaps and we're constantly working our entire careers and lives to fill those knowledge gaps as best we can. So, so those are two different options, but, but having students there, uh, I feel like makes people more comfortable. Uh, they forget about the camera. And so if you're feeling that you're, you're, uh, having some nervousness or anx anxiety about recording with the camera, and even I'm talking, not just recording now face where you can see my face, but just recording at the microscope, where it's my voice and me showing slides. Uh, still, I, I still, I mean, and I've made, I don't know, a hundred and some videos. I still occasionally feel a little like it's like very mild nervousness. And the way I can tell is that I'll put it off. I'll be like, I really want to make this video. I've got all the slides pulled and then I'll be like, well, not today. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. And I'm dragging my feet. And that's when I realized eventually, oh, I, I feel kind of slightly nervous about this. And I don't understand why. It doesn't make logical sense. But anyway, if you feel that way, you're in company with me. I don't know if it's good company or not, but it's company. Uh, so having a student there can help. Um, and uh, also, um, you know, it's okay to say, well, I'm not really sure about this, but this is the best knowledge that I have currently. And um, people can always correct you if you're wrong. And you can add a little comment under your video and say, oh, look, I made a mistake. I've done that before. I've said things I actually knew the right answer and I just misspoke and someone picked it up. And that's the beautiful thing about social media is that there's a way for people to comment and it's kind of an instant ongoing public peer review format, which is really good, right? It's a kind of a, I think it's kind of a beautiful model. So, okay, that's that's a lot of preaching about that, the how to get over nervousness. Um, again, do remember that you can always edit out. If you make a mistake, um, you can start over. One thing that I always fail to do, even to this day, is if I make a mistake, I don't pause at the end of my sentences like that. I talk fast and my sentences run together. And then when I go back to edit and realize, oh, I want to take this out, I realize there are, it's really hard to find the right place to clip without cutting off a sentence because I never actually pause. So learning to add some um, pauses in your video, probably you won't have this problem, but maybe it's just me. But if you're a fast talker like me, uh, learning to pause is good. And if you can learn to speak a little slower on the video, that will help because people who um, are not native English speakers do sometimes struggle to understand what I'm saying, even though I try to enunciate clearly. Um, also, for those of you who don't know, you can actually slow down the speed of YouTube videos or you can speed it up. The little gear symbol in the bottom corner, you can click on it and you can make it faster or slower. And you can add uh, subtitles and we'll talk about that stuff later on when we talk about YouTube, um, um, the technical features of YouTube. So make videos, don't worry about making them perfect. There are ways to get around feeling nervous and don't don't feel like you need to be the world expert on something to make a video about it. If I feel like if it's good enough for me to do for my own real life patience and practice, then it's good enough for me to share. And you can always give the caveat, I'm not an expert, but here's how I handle this situation in my practice. If you have better ways to do it, please let me know and we can all learn together. I feel like that's probably okay. Some people might disagree with me, but I mean, I feel like if it's not good enough uh, for my patients, then I probably shouldn't be shouldn't be using it on my patients if it's not good enough for me to share with others. That's the way I think of it for myself. 
Um, but that said, I don't make videos about very many things where I don't feel, you know, unless I feel really comfortable with that topic. If it's something that I'm not really confident about, I'll usually get someone else as a guest lecturer to come on the channel uh, to make a video with me. Um, and I found that it's been easy, actually, so say you get into this and you like making videos, a great thing you can do is get your senior wise experts who have been doing pathology for decades and say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, would you like to make a YouTube video? Surprisingly, a lot of them will say, yeah, that's cool. Let's do it. You can say, could we do this topic? Do you have some slides? Do you want me to get slides? You could use a PowerPoint that they give, um, and I'll teach you how to record uh, PowerPoints and and offer say I'll take care of all the technical stuff I'll record it I'll edit it I'll let you see it at the end and if you don't like it we can just delete it um, and then I'll take care of putting it on YouTube so that people can learn for free all around the world you'd be surprised at how many people uh, even people that might not seem very techy are actually happy and willing to teach and to have that teaching used publicly provided someone else can help them with the technical aspect so if you get good at the technical aspect what a beautiful, amazing thing you're doing for the world by helping get world famous experts or really experienced people to make videos with you and then sharing those publicly. And that records for posterity all of that wisdom. Um, and also it gives them a chance to be able to participate in global education without having to learn new technical skills. So I personally feel like that's a really important important part of my career now, a meaningful part is to, to video interview some of the experts in, in dermatopathology and soft tissue pathology, and also to help convince some of those people to use social media or at least to make videos with me so that I can share their teaching uh, with other people in the world. And so I think that this is now that I know how to do this, um, opening up those doors and making the access easier, I think is an important thing for me. So let's see if there's anything else I forgot. Um, I guess that's probably it. I may add in more later, but I will um, show you first uh, how I use glass slides and record those with a, a mounted camera. And then I'm going to show you the screen recording technique that you can use for like digital slides on a website like KikoXP.com or um, uh, PathPresenter.net or a site like that or with your own internal um, uh, server. And that ding was my phone and a good reminder why you should silence your phones when you're recording uh, videos. Um, okay, let's look at how to make um, videos now. Okay, so here's the setup I currently use when I'm recording videos of glass microscopic slides. So this is um, our multi-headed uh, Olympus microscope. Um, obviously other microscopes would work, but Olympus is what I've uh, pretty much always used. And what we have here is you, you pick out your tray of slides, whatever you want, uh, make sure they're nice and clean, of course. And we, uh, I use this camera right here. This is um, a Canon Rebel T6i. I don't know if you can see it there. Um, and it's basically a um, mass market produced um, DSLR uh, camera that people use for taking pictures. But there's a nice company, Martin Microscope. I have no financial conflict of interest. I just really like their products. They make this adapter tube that basically will mount the Canon camera onto the top of your scope. You do have to have a uh, camera port on the top of your scope. Uh, but if you already have a port for a camera, you can easily get one of these adapters. Um, I think the current uh, model that they sell is actually a T7i, but I've had this for several years and it's worked great. And basically all the videos that you watch on my YouTube channel where you can tell that I'm using glass slides, they're made with this camera right here on this scope. And um, uh, I think the whole thing costs uh, maybe $1,600 for the camera plus the adapter tube. If you already have one of the cameras, I think the adapter is uh, less than that. But in any case, it's, it's a pretty good deal compared to a lot of the other uh, microscope branded cameras. For the camera, the thing you have to do is um, before you open the software, uh, switch the little dial here from on down to video. And then, then you can open up the software or it will open automatically, but you want it to be in the video mode. Otherwise, I really don't touch any of the buttons on the camera. I control everything from the software. And then it comes with the software here, which if you can see, it's the EOS utility. And when you open it up, it gives you some options. So what you do is you open it. And um, I have noticed one occasional glitch with this. If you're on a computer that's on a network with multiple users that log in, it seems like if other people are logged in, sometimes the, the utility doesn't want to start and it'll say utility cannot start and then just restart the computer and then it will work uh, mildly frustrating but but uh, that's the way to work around it is just restart so what you do is you click um, remote shooting here 
All right, and then here are your options. So there's a few things here. The, this lets you control the camera remotely. So uh, one thing I did, and you can play around with the settings on yours, is the white balance shift. So I found that sometimes the white balance, the little dot starts in the middle here, but I found that I needed to shift mine down to kind of make it brighter. And you'll notice that in some of my videos, the background's a little darker, sometimes it's brighter. And that's because uh, one of the issues with doing uh, videos this way is that you do occasionally have trouble getting the camera to have the proper white balance and the proper lighting. Um, these cameras are not really made for microscopes. And so having a, a bright white backlit background is uh, sometimes challenging for the camera to adjust to, okay? So in any case, uh, once you do this, you can adjust that and, and you can play around with that setting. That's about the only setting I've really messed with other than white balance, uh, the actual white balance, I'll show you in a second. But I have adjusted that downward and I feel that that's better. It's, it's kind of more dim and dark in the middle and moving it downward gets it brighter. But if you go too far, it'll really wash out your color. So what you do next is you click live view shoot. And this will open a bigger window here. Hold up a second. So there, I've, I've maximized the window now so you can see. And um, what happens is if you take the slide, put the slide on the stage, you can now see what's on the microscope, okay? So again, make sure your slides are clean and that you get it the right way up. And then you need to make sure that you're focused on the screen. So focus it so that it's so that the, the image on the screen is in focus. And I'm recording this with my my phone, so that's why you're seeing all these weird lines here, obviously. Uh, but I figure it's kind of hard to record a video of making a recording, but I'm doing the best I can. So um, you get it focused on the screen and then try to focus your eyepieces. I find that as I drive the slide around, I just kind of talk my way through it and I continue to adjust the uh, focus and the light as needed to make sure that what's on the screen is in focus, okay? So tr I try to, to not look through the eyepieces as much as I can, I try to look at the screen and drive. And if you're new at this, that'll take a little getting used to. I also have a bigger screen up here on the wall, a big monitor, and that's actually pretty helpful, I find. Um, sometimes it'll give you, a, it's a little easier to have that. If you if you don't have it, no worries. You can easily do it with a, a computer monitor. We just have kind of a dual monitor set up here uh, for teaching purposes. Okay, one thing that I do find is the white balance. And I go back and forth here. There's two ways you can do it. You can set it to auto where it will adjust automatically. And that looks pretty good right there, right? But then I have times where I have it on auto and once I get down in here at higher power, sometimes it looks good. Like right there, it looks beautiful. But then I'll have other times where it really doesn't and while I'm doing the video, it will change back and forth and then I'll have trouble. So um, I, again, I've tried it both ways and sometimes it seems to work nice on the auto and sometimes it doesn't. So the other way to do it is to go away, move your tissue off so you're out to the side and then go over here, click down and go to custom and then click the little uh, eyedropper and it'll say, do you want to make a custom preset and say, okay. And again, this software probably does way more stuff than I know. I just, I'm a simple guy. I just figured out one way to make it work. It works good enough. And I went with it. Uh, you may know some better tricks. And if you do, please leave a comment down below and let me know. So I just click with my mouse there and that white balances. You didn't really see a change here because I just white balanced it a minute ago. Uh, for a video I just made. So in any case though, you just click and then it will be set. And you just go up here and click again to turn that off. And now the white balance is set and um, the, uh, the slide should be uh, in relatively good white balance. So again, it just kind of depends and you have to play around with it. And I find that it's different. Um, it seems like it depends on the weather or the day. It's a little finicky sometimes, but I find that also it, it, di it differs based on what kind of tissue I'm showing. When I show uh, squamous cell carcinomas and keratinocytic things or keratoacanthomas like this, where there's a bunch of bright pink and then some darker blue, I find that it has a little bit more uh, trouble figuring out how to adjust the lighting and the white balance with all these very different colors and, um, and patterns going on. Whereas if I have a big piece of soft tissue tumor that's all the same, it seems to do a lot better with that. But those are some settings to play around with. That's pretty much all I do. And then to record, and by the way, I don't use any special microphone. The built-in microphone on this, I think works really well. And I haven't personally felt any need. I just put, um, put signs on the door saying I'm recording so people will hopefully not uh, bust in and be loud and you know, turn your phone on silent, all that stuff. And then all you do is you just go down to the corner here and you click record and it will start recording. Usually the recording will go all the way up to 20 minutes. 
And at that point, the, the this is a limitation, I, uh, as far as I understand it, it's a limitation of the memory card and the camera. Oh, by the way, I, one thing I did is I bought a much bigger memory card because the small one that comes with the camera, at least when we bought this, uh, really doesn't cut it. These videos end up being really massive. And so, um, uh, and you know, you want, I'm recording at 1080p high definition because why not, right? It, why not get the the best possible resolution if you're going to make a teaching video. And then um, you can always buy bigger hard drives. Hard drives are cheap. So um, I'll talk about that in uh, a little bit later. So the, um, the I have it recording. You can see it's going, but it will, when it gets up to 20 minutes, it will do one of two things. Either it will keep going and it will just make a separate video file that, that just merges. You'll have one video that cuts off at one point, and then we'll, the next uh, video file will start immediately with you uh, right where you were. And uh, then you can just use an editing program and merge those together. But sometimes at 20 minutes, it will just turn off. So if you're getting close to 20 minutes, uh, I usually try to pay attention. And if I'm, if I'm doing a long video, as you guys know, I like to do, um, I will, uh, if I get close to 20 minutes, I'll usually just go ahead and stop the recording and then uh, go ahead and uh, then click start again and, and keep going where I was so I know that it doesn't cut off because it's frustrating to have it cut off in the middle of what you were saying and then five minutes later you realize, oh, it hasn't been recording for five minutes. And I've had that happen a few times and it's kind of frustrating. So you can see that the audio is working there. Uh, sometimes, especially when you're first starting out, try a little test video, record five or 10 seconds and then stop and save it and then, uh, and then listen to it and play it back and make sure it worked. Okay, so when you're all done with your recording here, just click this button again and it will stop, okay? And then when you click um, to uh, X out of this uh, screen up here, if you click uh, to X out, it will give you this option. Let's see if we can get it here. It'll say uh, download the recorded movie files and you can say uh, cancel and you can just do it later. I usually like to download it right away after I've made a video. I wanna make sure I can get it safely uh, off of the camera onto my hard drive and backed up ASAP uh, so that I don't have to repeat the whole thing over again. So I just click download and then it will go ahead and it takes a, it'll give you this option right here and it'll say it's gonna download the, the video file and you can uh, tell it where you want it to put it and then just click download and then it'll go ahead and download. And it takes a little time to download, especially if it's a really long video, it may take five or 10 minutes sometimes. This is a very short video. Um, and I'll let you watch because I'm gonna show you what happens next. Cause I feel like some of these steps are kind of intuitive to me now, but it took me a little while to figure out some of the things. So then it has its own uh, software that comes with the camera, um, which I really have not used uh, much at all. But it does have a software for both uh, pictures and videos to uh, to kind of sort them out there. But I find that that there's not really a need to use it. But more importantly, let's see where it put it on the desktop here. I'm looking for it. Oh, there. It's probably in this folder. It will make a folder with the uh, the day and or the date on it, and then it will put the uh, the file right in there. And uh, here it is. And that was another video I made earlier. So the file's right in there and um, you can see it's an MP4 and it's a minute and 48 seconds long. Okay, so let's talk about uh, how to do uh, a different type of recording before we talk about editing. So uh, sometimes I do glass slides using the mounted camera like I just showed you. And in fact, that's probably most of what my videos are. But you don't have to have a microscope uh, at all or a camera mounted on your microscope to be able to make videos. You can make videos by doing uh, screen recordings or by doing recordings of yourself talking. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that. And I'm going to focus on how I do it, which is with a MacBook. Um, that's the only way I really have done much with. There are programs in Windows, um, like I think Camtasia and probably others that do screen recording. But it, in my it's been a few years since I've uh, really played around with Windows trying to do screen recordings. I found that it was a little bit more uh, difficult to, to figure out how to make it work in Windows without getting software. Whereas here in a MacBook, um, it's a lot easier because it comes with a QuickTime, which is a free program that's already installed on the computer. So if, if any of you have comments about how to, to do good screen recordings with uh, in the Windows environment, uh, please uh, post info down in the comments below. I'm sure it can be done. It's just outside of what my current knowledge is. So like for any video that involves tech stuff, by the time you watch this, if you're watching this in the future, right now it's November 2019, um, this may be way out of date and some of the things I'm going to show you may have changed. But I figure it's better to show you what I know now 
and uh, you can always um, uh, learn new things over time as the programs change. So currently, um, I'm still using a, a MacBook that's actually about five years old. Uh, it's amazing how long Macs last. I, I, I do own uh, some Apple stock, so I guess <laughs> I guess that's a small conflict of interest, but probably not really. But for full disclosure now, you know. Uh, but anyway, I just have been really happy with MacBooks because they actually really work. And uh, I, I always used PCs before, but I finally switched to Mac about five years ago. But this is what my current setup is. So if you have a different setup than this, um, this is my uh, the Mojave operating system and the version I'm currently at. And... Um, and all of the other stuff. So anyway, that's what I'm currently using. Um, what I'm going to show you works with the current setup I have, but but if you have a different version of some of the software installed, it's possible that some of the steps might be a little different. So that's the only reason I'm bringing this um, up. All right. So to make a, a recordings with the MacBook, what you do is first you click down here on the icon for QuickTime Player. Um, I find that it seems to work better with QuickTime Player, which is I think like the free version rather than QuickTime Pro. I'm sure QuickTime Pro must be able to do this, but I remember trying it before and having trouble finding um, the right button. So maybe I'm just inept. Um, if you can't find, if, if QuickTime Player isn't down here on your um, bar of icons, um, you can go over to the the Finder and or the Finder, I'm sorry, and, and look for it um, in the, um, or I guess, you, no, I'm sorry, Launchpad. You go to Launchpad and look for it. So um, I'm doing a PowerPoint right now. This is not actually showing you the screen live because I wasn't sure how to record a video of me recording a screen video. So I just took screenshots. So um, QuickTime Player, uh, open that up. And once I open it, it always pops up this window of like, hey, what file do you want to open to play? But I don't want to open a file. I'm trying to make a video. So I click cancel. And then what I do is go up here to file. So it's got to say QuickTime player in the top corner. Sometimes in um, in the Mac environment, if you have one program open, but then you click on a PowerPoint or something else, it'll switch over to that program. So if, if you're having trouble finding any of this, make sure it says QuickTime player there. If not, go back and click on it to open it up again. Then go to click file. And then um, go to new movie recording if you want to record with the camera and you talking to the computer. So that's one way to do videos if you're talking about you know something you want to discuss rather than showing a slide. So for example, you click new movie recording, and here is what it pops up. It pulls up the front facing camera, and then down here there's a little, I've covered it up, there's a little tiny arrow next to the record button. There's a little down arrow. When you click it, it'll open a drop down menu, and make sure that you've selected your FaceTime HD camera, or if you have a plug-in like um, high def camera, um, select whatever camera you want to use. And um, I use the, usually just use the FaceTime camera and the internal microphone. And I always set my quality for maximum. I mean, I know it takes up more recording space or storage space, but hard drives are cheap and I would rather record the highest resolution possible and figure out later how to store the big files. So anyway, make sure that's all turned on and then click the record button and then you can record yourself talking. So like at the beginning of this video where I was talking about, hi, I'm Jared Gardner and I'm, I'm going to talk to you about how I make videos today. This is how I recorded it right here. Alternatively, you can use an iPhone um, or whatever smartphone or other video device you want, just aimed at yourself. I find honestly that the iPhone video quality is better because I have a, a new uh, new uh, model iPhone. Uh, the video uh, is much better quality actually than my front facing HD camera, but it's kind of just nice to have the, the video file already recorded on the computer. So uh, depending on the on my mood or what I'm doing, I might sometimes record with my phone, transfer the file to the computer for editing, um, or just record it with the computer. But in any case, here's how to record it with QuickTime on the computer. And then the, the next thing is, let me show you how to do a screen recording. So the screen recordings are really helpful because this is how you can sit down with a PowerPoint and and record or with a um or with uh, digital slides and record. And um, there is a way actually to do voiceover recording on a PowerPoint rather than screen recording. And I think it makes smaller files. Um, and uh, I just haven't really played around with that much. And screen recording is pretty easy to do. So I just usually do that. So for screen recording, you do the same thing. Make sure to QuickTime player, you've clicked that it's pulled up, click file, and then um, click new screen recording. And when you click that, it's gonna pop up this little box. Make sure that you've got your microphone turned on. Again, I use an internal mic that's built into the computer and when you're ready click do click the record button when you do that this box will pop up it'll say you can just click somewhere anywhere to record the full screen or you can drag and make a box to record part of the screen I always just record the full screen because again I want it to be the highest resolution so I want it to have the biggest field of view possible 
Um, but if you want, you can say, I just want this area to record. But I think the resolution may be lower if you do that. I, so I always just do full screen because I'm worried about things that make the resolution lower. So when you're ready, um, you click and notice this little this little um, icon up here that's popped up at the top, okay? This is telling you whether or not you're recording. So once you click to record, you'll notice that that little icon turns solid white. And that tells you that it's recording, okay? The first time you do this, try it out and do a short clip and then uh, save it to make sure that it worked and everything worked well. Because there's nothing worse than recording like a 30-minute video and realizing that the audio didn't work and the whole thing's silent. So just, you know, I, I still am a little, I, I'm, I'm paranoid that, about things not working. And so I still, the first time I'm recording a video, Video, I, uh, for the day, I often like to do a short test clip just to make sure everything's working correctly and there's no problems. So while that's running, uh, while that's recording, then you can just forget about QuickTime and open up and do whatever else and everything that's happening on your screen will be recorded and everything you're saying um, will be recorded. And again, if you make a mistake, remember you can always edit it out later, so don't, don't freak out, it's okay. Okay, so now that you're recording, you can just pull up whatever you want and make a video and it'll just show what's on your screen. So for example, um, you can pull up a PowerPoint and then just put it into full screen mode. And then you can edit the video later to clip out this part at the beginning if you want, or you can just leave it. It doesn't matter. People, people will tolerate it. Um, in general, don't let editing get in the way of you making videos. That's a mistake I made early on that I wanted everything to be perfect. And because of that, I didn't make videos because it took too much time. So even if people can see, you know, just make sure you don't have like your social security number or your financial info on the screen, but does it really matter if you can see my desktop? No, it doesn't, so who cares? People people will watch the video anyway. So pull this up and then just put it into your uh, presentation mode, your full screen uh, mode. And then you can talk about here's a lipoblast with lipid vacuoles and here's mucin filled or mixoid filled vacuoles and a pseudolipoblast and click through the slides like that. Uh, the other thing that you can do uh, in addition to, to PowerPoints is you can actually use whole slide digital images either from software on your computer or your own internal um, server or um, from an online server. So for example, two websites I really like are Kiko, um, uh, KikoXP.com and PathPresenter.net. And I've got um, a lot of slides on both of those, and they're both great uh, kind of different websites, but both of them host uh, digital slides. So here on Kiko, I can go to my, uh, my slide bank of slides I've uploaded, and here's a big batch I just sent. And uh, this website was started uh, by my friend, uh, Dr. John uh, Ho, who's done really great work with this. And so let's say bacillary angiomatosis, and then here's the case, and I'll click it, and then um, once, uh, once it's there, you can just pull it up to full screen and you can, um, you can make this, uh, your browser window bigger. And even though you don't see that, that bar in the background saying it's recording, it's still recording. And then here you can uh, rotate to flip it around to look, uh, the way that you want so that it's right side up. Oops, wrong way. I guess I need to go the other way. There we go. And say, look, it's a nodule of uh, endothelial proliferation of vascular proliferation in the dermis. And there's vessels here with plump endothelial cells and a lot of fibrin and blood and um, some neutrophil debris in the middle. Let's get closer so you can see there's a little debris in there. And then over here towards the middle is the diagnostic findings, little purple hazy colonies uh, right there. And there, that purple uh, kind of violet colored fluffy stuff, that's the, the colonies of uh, Bartonella hensley organisms that cause vascular angiomatosis. So you can uh, go through a bunch of digital slides that way, or you can go to Path Presenter and do the same thing. You can either pull uh, slides up out of your slide box, or you can put them into a presentation mode. And Path Presenter uh, was uh, founded by my uh, uh, friend Raj Singh. And again, another really great site that's that's fantastic. And I like using both Kiko and Path Presenter. I've been very happy with. So here, if I pull a case up, um, from my box and then you can see and this is a mix of fibrous sarcoma and again I can adjust the adjust it to make it look nice and and uh, uh, horizontal if you want and say look in here in the subcutis we've got a mixoid tumor and it's got hyperchromatic atypical cells so it's a mix of fibrous sarcoma grade one um, I have a video on mix of fibrous sarcoma if you're curious you can look on my YouTube channel and then here's the classic infiltration in between the subcutis so you can see the lobules of subcutaneous fat and the tumor is just kind of trickling and snaking its way along um, in between the subcutaneous 
uh, septa or um, also um, along, sometimes it'll go along the fascia and often goes all the way out to the, the peripheral margins because of that. Um, so anyway, that's those are different ways you can use whole slide images. And if you have uh, your whole slides on Kiko or on Path Presenter, you can then also copy the link and um, and you can use that and paste it into your, um, your video description once you upload it on YouTube so that your viewers can actually click a link to see the whole slide image and explore it for themselves if they want. And now let me show you a little trick that it took me a while to learn this. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell um, if you're signed into uh, something, whether it's a website like like one of these where you're you're logged in, or or say you're sharing a link from you know uh, to a PubMed, but it's from within your university, and you want to know if the link's going to actually work to people who are not logged in. A great way to check this, and and a tool that I'll talk about later with uh, YouTube uploading, is go ahead and open a uh, incognito browser window. And so those are for private browsing, and sometimes people associate this with just uh, nefarious uses. But uh, actually, it's really useful if you're swapping between accounts because what it'll do if you click new incognito window um, or you can hit command shift n if you like hotkeys like I do and it'll open a new window where you're logged out of everything okay so you can you'll be logged out of all your accounts basically it strips away all the login and basically makes you kind of a new um, a new um, uh, instance without logging you out on your other um, Chrome window so see if I open back uh, I guess you can't see it there I'll show you but here you paste in here and then click enter and make sure it still works and if it works in an incognito window then that means you can send this link to to pretty much anyone and it should work okay so that's a nice way to test that out it's also a nice way if you're logged into say one YouTube account and you want to swap to another one or one Gmail account you want to swap to your other Gmail um, or swap between social media accounts just open up a new incognito window and sign in and that and it will leave you um, so see here I could I could be logged into a different YouTube account here and um, and yet uh, when I close this incognito window it brings me right back to where I was in my other uh, Chrome window so it's kind of like creating separate instances um, of, uh, of Chrome on the same computer, but they're functioning independently of each other, if that makes sense. So that's really a useful way to test links and also to swap between accounts. All right, so um, when you're done, in any case, I've gone on and on here. So when you're done, just close your, uh, your uh, uh, Chrome window and then uh, go up here and click uh, stop the recording and then it will let you save. All right, so when you finish the video, you clicked uh, you clicked to stop to stop the recording, and as soon as you click that stop, what will happen is a window will pop up and it'll say untitled, and basically you can see this is the the video of the, the start of the video when I was uh, first showing the screen and first click screen record. So um, so it's showing you that, and um, then what you can do is you can actually I know it's a little scary. You can either click file up here and save, or if you just click X, it will automatically prompt you to save. So if I click um, X, it will say, what do you want to do? Do you want to delete this? Um, don't click that unless you really don't want it. Or do you want to save it? So I click the X and then I click save and I type in here, you know, uh, uh, a whole slide image, bacillary or angiomatosis or whatever, and decide where you want to save the file. You can drop down here to explore and find like a different hard drive or something and then click, um, click save and then you're done. Okay, now let's talk about video editing. And again, I am not in any way an expert at video editing. When I first started making videos, I didn't even know how to basically splice two or three clips together. So I've come a long way since then, but there are people out there who are really amazing at this and probably will look at this video and laugh. And that's okay. If you've got resources or advice, please leave them in the comment section down below and teach all of us because I know that I have a lot to learn in this area. But I'm going to show you the basics of what I do. And again, it seems to be good enough. It makes good enough videos. People watch the videos and say that they're useful. So I'm going to keep going even though I'm not an expert. Again, I use my MacBook for this because I found that this program that comes with the MacBook is easy to use. And it's called I'm movie so go down here and open up iMovie again if you can't find it um, look over here in the in the launch pad uh, to find it and once iMovie is open it will um, give you this option to uh, create a new uh, project and you can see here's all these other projects that I've had uh, these videos are a lot uh, all on my YouTube channel but you can say uh, create new and make a movie and then um, here you're going to import media. So say you've recorded two clips that you want to splice together or do some editing on. Okay, so click here to import media. 
and it will open up a browsing function. And so I, uh, I often move my, um, my files around, uh, particularly the big video files. Um, when I'm first working on them, I keep them in an external hard drive. I always keep them backed up on a computer. I, my basic general rule is I never keep anything on an external drive or on a USB thumb drive that is not present somewhere else. I never let an external portable device be the only place where I have a file. So once I make a file, I basically almost always save it in Dropbox on my desktop so that it's basically on my computer, either my laptop or my desktop computer, and then is also backed up to the cloud through Dropbox. I'm ultra paranoid about losing data. And so um, so that's what I do. But anyway, I put a copy of the file um, uh, onto this hard drive to port it around. If you're using a MacBook, a MacBook and especially if you're going back and forth between Mac and Windows, because I, um, I tend to, uh, I have a Windows PC for, uh, for other purposes. So in moving files back and forth, what I found after doing research, and again, this is uh, relevant as of 2019, maybe this will be different in the future. I think the best format to use to go back and forth is XFAT. So if you buy a hard drive, a lot of times they, they come with, I think it's NTFS uh, formatting, and you have to reformat it into XFAT. So when you get a brand new hard drive, and you can read online, just look up how to format hard drive to XFAT. For those of you who are just new to computers, remember, if you format a hard drive, it will delete everything on it, okay? So you want to make sure that you're formatting the right drive and that you are um, formatting a drive that is empty or that has nothing on it of value. So you don't want to accidentally format a drive that's supposed to be your backup drive. So I actually... Un Again, this is kind of going off on a tangent, but why not? This is already a super long video. Um, I, uh, When I'm formatting a drive, a new drive, I make sure that it's the right drive. I unplug all of my other external devices just in case so that I don't accidentally select the wrong one. And anyway, um, you can, again, uh, look up online how to format to XFAT. Um, XFAT's not perfect, but it lets you move big files. And I think, I can't remember what the other format, I think, I can't remember what the other format was. It's been a while since I've read about this. But anyway, it wouldn't let me move big enough files. And some of these video files end up being like 80 gigabytes. Um, we'll talk about why in a minute. All right. So anyway, the, all of that aside, I use a, um, I think currently I'm using a Western Digital 4 terabyte um, drive. And I'll put some links down below of the different devices and uh, products I use. I'm sure there are lots and lots of different options, but um, that's what I've been using. So um, in here, I've got a... Um, uh, let's see which folder it is. This folder I think will work. And it's got videos of uh, Kerato acanthoma. So let's uh, import that one. It's 18 minutes long. And just click import. Actually, let's do two. We'll select both of them. So I just held the command or the control button and click both. And then click import all. And it'll take it a minute, especially if it's on an external. It it will immediately let you start working with the files. But as you, what you'll see is that these circles... Um, will eventually fill up and once the see there you can see it's starting to, to work now um, and it will eventually fill up all the way once the file is completely moved into the computer hard drive um, and uh, before you can finalize the video it has to basically completely um, uh, download from the hard drive into the computer transfer so um, these are the files that you're going to work with and down here is kind of the working space so I'm going to say I'm going to take this video and drag it down here all right and then say this was part two of that same video, and I can just drag that right there, okay? I'm just selecting it and dragging it down. So at the end, I can make a video. If I just wanted to splice, I could splice these two together. I can, I'm gonna click on this, and then hold on my MacBook, I'm holding the Command button and clicking on this one too. See how they're both uh, highlighted now and lit up? And then I can go up here to this little arrow button, the Share button, click that. And it's going to give you several options. And the first option might seem like you would want to say YouTube. But I have tried this. And again, I may just be not um, technically savvy enough. I've tried this a few different ways. And I've found that some of the options that seem like they'd work make videos that are not as high quality as the video I originally recorded. And that's not acceptable to me. I recorded with a, a 1080p high definition camera. I want to have all of that high definition saved. Okay. So what I end up doing doing is instead of it being for YouTube, I just go to click on file and then you can uh, double click on this and call it, you know, Carido Acanthoma. And then I usually add some comment like edited 
uh, or complete so that I know that this is the final edited version of the file. And then down here, I click on resolution. I always want to make sure resolution is on 1080p. I set the quality to best pro resolution and compression. I put it on better quality. I don't care about it being fast. I want it to be good. Here's the problem with this. If you notice at the beginning when I selected these files, I think this 18 minute video is like six gigabytes and this one was maybe like, I don't know, 800 megabytes or something. Um, so to put together, this should be about seven gigabytes uh, and this is how they came recorded from the camera. These two videos, uh, if you'll remember, I recorded these on the, the Canon Rebel T6i that's mounted to my microscope. But look what it's saying now. It's saying it's going to take 19 minutes to finally edit this video or to produce the final edited video and 22 gigabytes. How and why does this happen is beyond my understanding. But I found that whenever I combine files and I put it on no compression, highest resolution, highest quality, it makes the size of the final video multiple times bigger than the size of the initial video. There is probably a solution for this, but, oh, I probably should spell keratoacanthoma right, huh? I'm sure that was bothering a lot of you, sorry. Um, uh, in any case, the, uh, the I, I've... Googled this, I've looked, I've tried to figure it out. If someone knows the answer, please let me know. But anytime I've adjusted and tried to compress it even just a little bit, I definitely notice a difference and I definitely notice pixelation. And again, the reason I want these, I want these videos to look as close as possible to someone sitting next to me at the microscope. So I would rather have a massive 20 or 80 or 100 gigabyte file. It doesn't matter. I can't remember the YouTube limit, I think is 100. It's somewhere around 100 gigabytes. So as long as your file size is less than that, and even my mega videos that end up being a couple hours long or an hour and a half long, they I've never yet made a video, knocking on wood here, I've never yet made a video that's too big that YouTube did not allow me to upload it. So I'll burn that bridge when I get there. But for now, I'm basically saying, well, these videos are massive and I wish they weren't, but I just put them on this external drive. I upload once I upload it to YouTube, then you, can, you have two options. You can either just keep um, the the video only on your external drive and use YouTube as kind of your backup. You can go later and download videos back from YouTube. Unfortunately, when you download them back currently, it will only let you download them back in 720p, not 1080p. It'll let them be viewed in 1080p, but I don't think that there's a way that I know of to download them back. Uh, maybe there's an app that can do it or something, but basically I've had trouble getting them back down from YouTube. But the point is, is I feel like YouTube's a pretty safe place and um, you know it's owned by Google. Google saves everything forever. And uh, so I feel like my videos, once they're on YouTube, they're they're probably pretty safe and even if my hard drives and everything crash and I lose all my stuff, I like the fact that knowing that the videos on YouTube means it's safe. So anyway, there's a long spiel about that and um, and I'm recording this over a period of, of uh, several days, over a week or two, so if I'm repeating stuff, sorry, it's because I forgot that I already told you in the last time I was recording a clip. All right, so finally, I've got all that settings and then I click next. And it will ask me, uh, where do you want to save the video to? And then you pick uh, wherever you want to save it to. Again, I usually go back to my external hard drive and I'll have it right there. If you have enough room on your, your computer hard drive, it's probably better just to write it to um, have it saved to somewhere on your, your desktop and then move it to the hard drive. I feel like it's a little faster if it saves to your internal drive on your computer rather than to an external drive. But um, I, my hard drive is getting kind of full now and um, on my computer and so it's easy to save it on the massive external drive uh, that I have okay so then I can go in here and I and I have a folder for my current projects that are in process and then in my edited videos is where I save the final edited version and you click save and then once I click save you'll see that it will start working on it and it will have this little circle here again and it will show me the progress on the video and if you click on it it'll say okay it's getting ready to to write the video to an MOV file and it's got 21 minutes left and the little um, the little pie chart will go around until the whole thing is done alright so that's the basics of how to just splice two videos together now let me show you some more in-depth stuff about editing all right, let's, let's look at a little bit more in-depth editing from just the basic splicing of two clips together. So down here, you can see this is the whole video and you can scroll through it like this. It's real hard to edit here because this 18 minutes is a tiny little thing, but watch what happens. If I go up here, I can move this zoom bar on the settings and I can zoom in. So I can see individual parts of the clip. So then if I click play, 
Oma type that's just superficially biopsied because I see that scenario happen a lot in my practice. So you can play it along and pause it and this bar will move, okay? And if you want to go, if you want to be able to edit little fine parts there, it's better to zoom in even more, okay? And then again, if you need to zoom out to see where you are, you can drag the bar back across, okay? So if I'm if I'm zoomed in here, say say I didn't like what I said here or I wanted to remove it. Biopsied. Okay, so say I made a mistake here and I wanted to clip it out. What I'm going to do is you can listen to it to make sure you found the part you want, and you can see how your voice bar goes up and down. The You can see where the uh, the little peaks rise and fall. Sorry, it's distracting to talk and listen to myself talk at the same time. And um, so eventually you'll get to the point where you can recognize where you start certain words by the sound. It's pretty, it's kind of cool actually. Um, if you're annoyed by listening to the sound of your own voice, editing video clips of yourself will get you over that annoyance pretty quickly. I used to hate the sound of my own voice. I still am not super fond of it. But after listening to hundreds of hours of it basically making videos, I've just gotten over it and don't care anymore. All right, so say I want to remove this part. So what you need to do here is move your arrow up so it's over the film strip. It won't work if you're up here, I think. And this is what I, I struggle with at first. So move over here and then if you're uh, on a, the pat the... Um, if you're on your uh, uh, touchpad of your MacBook, um, uh, you two finger tap, or uh, if you have a mouse, I think it's like a right, it's the equivalent of a right clip, uh, right click. So anyway, I put the, the, the line where I want it, hover my uh, arrow over the film strip, two finger tap, and then it gives me this options uh, window. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say split the clip right here. And it's going to split this. What was one clip is now two clips. If you go back out to low power, so to speak. Sorry, only pathologists talk like that. But since you're all pathologists, you can be cool with it. You can see that now we've got one video clip, two, three. So you can take start with one clip or whatever and clip it up into 100 different parts if you want and mix and match them, rearrange them, delete the ones you don't like. So that's how you can edit. So basically, where were we? We were back here and I said I wanted to clip this part all the way to this part. It looks bigger now, okay? So then I go to the next thing and say, okay, I want to start right up here, right up here where I bring the next slide on. So I'll put my uh, my line there. I tap once to get the get the line stable, and then I two finger tap and split clip again. And then what do I do? I select this part and click delete, and that whole area disappears and it's gone. Now remember, my original clips, the original raw files are not changed, okay? All the stuff that we're doing down here is not going to mess up the original files. In the end, both file one and file two up here are going to still be present on your hard drive, but you're going to get a new file that's the edited version of everything. So don't be afraid to clip and mess around with these. Everything down here, if you don't like it, you can delete all of it and start over. These two files are still going to be safe and sound on your hard drive. So you're not going to mess up the original file at all. You're just moving stuff from that file, cutting out parts you don't want, and then creating a third new file from your raw files that you started with. Okay? So that's how you can clip parts out. Um, Say that I was like, oh, this part actually, I didn't, I made a mistake there. So I went back and I re recorded another small segment and I want to insert that where the part was I deleted. I just grab this here and drag it over and drop it right there and it comes up in between. And again, there's a bunch of fancy stuff you can do with iMovie. You can add different audio files layered over top of your video. You can insert stuff. You can do a lot of things. If you want to add labels, and again, I I used to do this when I very first started. If you scroll all the way on my channel back to my nodular fasciitis uh, video or my angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma video, you'll see that in addition to talking slow, I had all these little pop-ups. I think I made that video with Camtasia, if I recall. But it takes a lot of time to do that. More recently, the um, the uh, uh, heme path board review video that I made with Dr. Jeanette Ramos about peripheral blood smears. You can see that I did add some labels in that because I thought it would be useful for viewers, but it took me some time. I spent an hour or two adding labels, but if you want to add labels, say right here at this part, you want something to pop up that says keratoacanthoma or something like that. Go up here to, uh, I think it's, is it titles or is it yeah, titles. Oh, you can use transitions that like fade from one clip to the next. There's all sorts of fancy stuff that you can do um, if you want to. Again, I'm kind of a simple person, so I don't. So you go to titles, and then titles here, you can add in any number of these. And these are meant to like title a video clip at the beginning, but I use them sometimes as in place of labels. So I kind of like this torn paper one. So I'll drag that down there and insert it right here. And then I'll type into it... Uh, KA for keratoacanthoma, 
and you know glassy you know cup shaped or whatever there and then it will be set there and i can say oh do i want it to play for only four seconds and it'll at pop that up. point the, the, right. this is a limitation i uh, as far as there i understand it, it's a limitation and if four of the seconds isn't long enough camera. oh by the way you can go back here and you can grab the end until so you go to that little bar of the title that you added in until the little double arrow shows up and drag it out as long and you can say now it'll stay up for 13 seconds all right, and so at the end, when you splice the whole thing together, all of that stuff will show up in the final video. You, again, you just select everything. If you've got a bunch of clips, you can just click the first one, hold the shift button, click the last one, everything will be highlighted, okay? If you wanna just do individual ones, you can hold the command button, okay? But again, then once I've made all the edits I want, I go up here to the, the arrow, share key, tell it I wanna save to a file, and name the file, make it at 1080p, and we're good to go, okay? So that's the way we can splice things out, rearrange things, edit things in. Okay, say you decide after you've got all this stuff here, you're like, you know what, go back to my media, that's where your raw files are. Say you wanna add another file. If you wanna add more files, click this little arrow button and that will open up your um, hard drive again and you can say, okay, what other files do I want to, to um, uh, get out of here? So let me look back in my hard drive and let's see what else I have. Um, oh, how about some from this how to make a derm path video or how to make a YouTube video? I'll do Oh, this intro that seems good and um, so I click on that and maybe I'll also do the um, Screen recording there, so I'll import those Okay, so one of these is me doing a video of looking at the camera and the other one's an example of me doing screen recording of, uh, of editing like we just uh, like I just showed you so um, if I want to put this down in here I can also drag that in and I can put it in between now some things you'll notice uh, one thing I've noticed is that oops, one thing I've noticed is and I'm just scrolling along here to go forward sometimes it's a little touchy it'll go from like low power to like super high power really really quickly I wish it had a little bit more fine control um, if you get here, in fact, the low power, uh, so to speak, that you can't see anything, scroll back over to the left. That's what's happened. So I'm probably way over explaining this, but some of these things confused me at first. And again, maybe it'll confuse you and hopefully this will help you. If you're still watching by now, I guess you probably want to learn. So um, sometimes though, you'll, you'll get close to the end of a clip here. You'll see. Like, um have a more open mind and change my views about but the video this might be louder and, um, here if you haven't yet please subscribe to my channel thanks so much for watching and then in the next clip because it was recorded with a different microphone the audio might be different hi i'm dr jared Gardner. maybe a little low it's not I'm too bad to here but if you want to change the audio if one of your clips is recorded a lot louder or a lot softer than the other you can click on that clip and go up here to the little um the little uh speaker and you can say oh i want to lower the volume of this clip down to 60% or I want to move it up to 300% make it louder so you can adjust and see the, the little yellow lines get bigger accordingly so sometimes that's helpful to make it so that you don't have it going from really quiet to the next clip blasting someone's eardrums out if they're listening um, on um, headphones okay so you can adjust clip um, and again there's lots of other editing options I don't use most of them but I'm sure that there's a lot of cool stuff that can be done um, if you uh, know what you're doing and I encourage you to explore that and see Okay, here's one more thing I want to show you. It's a kind of an annoying glitch that took me a while to figure out, and I finally found the answer online. So say you've done a screen recording, okay, and um, you're going to make a video just of you recording a PowerPoint or um, of yourself talking or something with your MacBook um, with either screen recording or camera. Okay, you've set it to record the screen in high resolution, so it should record in 1080p. Um, which is high res. So I got the file here. I pull it down here. Say I don't need to, you know, I've done my editing, whatever. I click it and then up here I go to make the file and I say, wait, I don't want 720p. I want 1080p. But look, 1080p is grayed out. I know I recorded it as 1080p. I don't know why it won't let me set 1080p. So it took me a long time to figure out why this was happening. And again, finally, I found the answer online. Here's what you do to fix this. It's kind of a weird glitch. It may not happen for you, but if it does happen, if you get a file that you know is recorded at 1080p high def and iMovie won't let you output it at 1080p, don't, don't give in to that. 
And here's how you fix it and work around. So cancel this. I'm gonna delete this back out of here. What I need is a video clip that I recorded with my camera, something else that's at 1080p. I don't know uh, if you don't have a video clip recorded from your camera. I'm not sure how to do this. Uh, I guess you can always uh, send me a message and I can find a little clip for you and, and share with you or something. Here's how I've done it. So let's go back and import. I'm going to find a clip from my camera, okay? So an MP4 clip. I don't know what it is about this, if it's the file type or what. I can't remember what it is that makes this work. I just realized, though, if I take one of the videos that I recorded with my mounted Canon Rebel camera, and you can experiment around and see which kind of file you need that works for you, but this worked for me. I import one of those, okay? And it doesn't matter what the video is. I'm going to delete this out in a minute. I'll show you. First, drag this video, the one that I took with my camera, down here. Then I'm going to drag down my screen recording afterwards. Okay. And then check to see if it works. Highlight both of them. Hold Shift and click them both. Go up here. Click File. And now look what happens. Now it'll let you do it at 1080p. Why? Who knows? If you have um, if you have a clip though that's recorded at lower resolution mixed in with a bunch of high res clips, it will usually lower the resolution of the whole video. Or that's my understanding. Okay, so one reason if you've got a bunch of clips together and one of them 720p, that could be why. But if you know that your clips are all 1080p and it's giving you this trouble, this is what's going on. So. So cancel this now. Just I, I did that to make sure it will work. So I drug the MP4 from my camera down first, then the screen recording. Now I just go back and delete that original one. And for some reason, having that, that file come in there first before adding the screen recording, now if I just click the screen recording and go up here, it'll let me put it out at 1080p. I don't know why, this is clearly just a glitch, but it really frustrated me for a while when I was trying to make videos where I was combining screen recording with uh, nice videos I had taken at 1080p, and iMovie was saying that I couldn't put it out at 1080p, and it, it's I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out, so hopefully this will help someone out there uh, figure it out, okay? So that's how you do it um, to fix that glitch if you encounter that. Okay, now we've recorded the video, we've edited it, and it's ready to upload to YouTube. Um, so open up Chrome or whatever browser you use. And again, I have a personal um, email account that I'm logged into on Chrome that I use for pretty much everything. But I decided to set up my YouTube as a separate channel under my professional email. Actually, both of those emails come to the same inbox. It doesn't make any difference to me. But I like that the, it's linked to my professional jmgardnermd at gmail.com. Um, so if you have a Gmail account, all you do is go to YouTube and log in. But um, but again, I, I like to I created mine separate, so it's kind of separate from my personal YouTube account that I'd use to watch you know fail videos or or whatever. Um, so uh, what what again, like I said earlier, what you can do is you can open your browser, but then go and open an incognito window. So even though I'm logged into my personal account on that window, now in this window I'm logged out and I can go ahead and log in to my professional account and I can be logged into both both Gmail slash YouTube accounts at the same time, just in different windows, okay? Um, so uh, here we go, this is my uh, YouTube page. And again, when you're first setting this up, you just have to get a Gmail account, go to YouTube, and and sign in with your, G your Gmail account info, and that will get you set up. So here I've got my sign in, and I've got, I have my password saved already. We're logged in. When you go, when you log in, um, you can see the list of all your videos, what what um, other use, what other people viewers would see, um, what your channel looks like. You can see your home, where all your your top most recent videos are up here. Your most popular videos are down here, based on like the number of plays they've received. You can also create playlists down here. So I have a playlist of of video interviews I've done of pathologists. I've got some medical inspiration videos. Um, you can see if we go over here, I've got vascular tumors, derm path for beginners, all that stuff. Okay. But, uh, what you want to, to do for uploading is go to YouTube studio. What you can do to, um, upload your new video is you click this little button here, the little camera with the plus on it and either do upload a video, which is the classic version or upload a video beta. It doesn't really matter. Let's do the classic version for now. Okay, and so select files to upload, and you can decide whether to set it as private, public, unlisted, or scheduled. Okay, the difference is a public is immediately live. I don't do that. I always upload mine first as a private video so that I have time to edit and make sure that the, the words and everything are, are 
correct. And then once I've got all of the details correct and I feel like it's ready to make live, you can either instantly make it public or um, schedule it to go public at a certain time, however you like. So I usually like to have it set up private first. Uh, now I select my um, hard drive where I have the, the file, go to my uh, edited videos, and there's the Caraway Canthoma final edited video. Click open. And now it's going to start instantly uploading, okay? And uh, then you can go ahead and while it's uploading, you got to leave the window open. If you have a slow internet connection, it may take a long time, sometimes overnight or a couple days, depending on how big the, fi the file is. So be prepared before you upload a large video to have either a desktop computer that's constantly connected or to have your uh, laptop left open and hooked up to Wi-Fi for some period of time, okay? This is normal to take, um, and I'm on actually a relatively fast network and it's still telling me three hours. Okay, so I have, you'll notice some of this stuff on mine is pre-filled. Um, I can't remember how to do this. I, I guess I'll have to look it up because I, I set it up a while ago. You can actually set up so that every time you upload a video, the same, you know, disclaimer or phrases are in here. Like, for example, mine says a video is for education only and isn't medical advice, of course, and it's presented by me and I've got a bunch of social media channels. So I have that pre-filled every time. And then up here I can edit and say, this is a video about carotid canthomas and I can type in, um, uh, uh, whatever I want to say here, okay? And you can put links in this area. So this is called a video description. Up here is the title. So I'll, I'll call it something like keratoacanthoma SCC or benign, make it sound kind of controversial. Maybe that's a little bit like clickbait, but we do talk about that in the video. And, um, uh, in any case, you can do all of that. You can also add some uh, tags down here. You can put in some different things here that will help people to be able to, if they're searching pathology or derm path or whatever, to be able to find the video, okay? Um, again, right here, it's set as private, but if you wanted to change it, you can go there and click on that tab and decide to make it public and then click save. Okay, so, but for right now, you just gotta leave it open until it uploads. And, um, and if you want, you can click done and it will continue to upload. It will save any changes you made here in the title and it will continue uploading and you just have to keep the page open until it uploads. Um, and uh, an important note uh, I'm gonna say now so I don't forget is once it uploads, if you watch the video as soon as it's uploaded, it will not look high definition. And you'll say, what happened to the beautiful file? After the video uploads, it does some processing and then there's some additional processing that happens and it may take up to 12 or 24 hours for the video to be available in 1080p. So don't freak out if it, once you upload, it will only let you watch it in 720p or a lower resolution. It seems like somehow, I don't fully understand, but YouTube um, releases a low res version of the video so it's available as soon as possible. And then eventually it gets the highest resolution available and after a day usually it should be fine, okay? Okay, so you're signed in to your uh, YouTube now. We've just uploaded the video. Um, Say you've come back uh, later and it's all uploaded. So go to the studio again. In studio, over here on the left, you've got dashboard, you've got videos. If you click that, it'll show you the list of all the videos um, on your channel, okay? And it'll show you ones you've uploaded. Here, this is a, a failed upload I had. Um, and then these are videos you can see. These are some uh, video interviews I did for the American Society of Dramatic Pathology over the past few years. And they've given me permission to share them on my channel. But instead of releasing them all at once, I've uploaded all of them. But I'm going to kind of uh, make them public over, you know, one every couple weeks or something. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's it just this is just my style. So, um, but you can see they're still marked as private. So I can see them in my list, but none of my followers can until I go in and mark them as public. So if I want to release the Sharon Weiss video or interview, you can click the little down thing and I can say, oh, I want to schedule it to become public on whatever date at whatever time. And there's this thing you can do, uh, which is called make it a premiere basically to say, kind of advertise it and say, oh, coming soon. Um, I've never tried that yet, but I'm sure it's cool. Um, I just haven't had the time to, to mess with it. So, or you can uh, say to publish now and say you want to make it public. All right, and then you click save and it will change the video settings. Um, and uh, let's see, so anyway, we've got, um, this video here. So let's click on the, the uh, link here to go back into the video to edit it. And you can see that there's a thumbnail. The, the thumbnail image 
is created by um, by YouTube, and it will sometimes take um, a few different shots and say, "Hey, here are three examples that you can pick." But you can actually also create your own thumbnail. You can take a microscopic image or a picture of whatever you want, and you can upload it as a thumbnail here. And there's a really cool website called Adobe Spark that is actually a very easy way to make really pretty thumbnails and all of the nice thumbnails that I use on my channel, at least I think they look nice. I make all of those for free with Adobe Spark. I will um, show you in a minute how I do that. Um, okay, so anyway, here you can change the title. Um, you can type in um, some description. And then also down here, if you, um, sometimes I like to do this particularly for longer videos, as many of mine are, I can type in the topics and I can say, oh, first we're gonna talk about clinical and say that that um, starts, that discussion starts at five minutes and uh, four seconds. And then we're gonna talk about the path. And that starts at six minutes and 35 seconds. And when, after you save it, these will actually become clickable um, timestamp links. When you view the video uh, publicly on YouTube, these will actually become clickable, um, uh, clickable uh, links that will take you directly to that part of the video. Okay, for example, here's a, the Durham Path Board Review video. Uh, that Raj Singh and I did, and I'll pause it here. But watch, let's say say we're starting at the beginning. But if you click down in the description, you can have you can add all sorts of stuff in here. So for example, for this video, we did all these uh, digital slides that we did as a live course in New York, and we presented them using the Path Presenter website that that Raj Singh founded. And if you want, I put a little Bitly link here that will take you. And if you click it, it will take you actually to the very presentation we used with all of the digital slides. So anyone who wants can go see those. So that's a nice option. This is all extra stuff. You don't have to do it, but I find that people um, potentially uh, find it useful. If they want, they can go explore the slides. You can link to other videos. I often do that. I often say, hey, these other videos that I made, um, you might find them useful um, if I think that they're relevant. And I add um, links to the literature, a lot of stuff. You can add all that stuff down in the video description um, back here. You can put it all into this area and it will show up here. But the nice thing is that, um, again, if for a long thing, you can go click here and say, you know, I want to go to the part about cryoglobulinemia. That's at 43 minutes and 10 seconds. If I click that, it will take you right to 4310. Moving on to the next case. And so that's really awesome that for a long video, you can you can set these here and you can <clears throat> direct people to them. You can actually even share the link that will, you know, publicly if you're on Twitter or something, you can say, I want to share a link. Someone has a question about, um, uh, you know, rheumatoid nodule. I can actually share that exact link there and tweet that um, and then someone can come to that part of the video and they don't have to scroll through four and a half hours to try to find where I talked about it. So I think that's a particularly helpful uh, helpful thing to do. And the, the reason I like to use Bitly links, I used to use uh, Google short links, but they've basically discontinued that service for some reason. But the Bitly links are nice because um, if you create a Bitly account and there are other link shorteners, um, it's not just to get the short link, but it's so that I can see the activity. I can actually go into my Bitly account and see how many times people have clicked on that link. So I can say, oh, look, a thousand times people have gone through and actually looked at this presentation or whatever. So I tend to use anytime I'm going to share links where, I, where I'm curious or interested to see um, how many people are using the link. I like to create a Bitly link for it and then I, I save the Bitly link or, or use the Bitly link here or save it in my phone um, if, I'm, if it's something I'm going to use on social media. And I think that's really helpful because you can log into Bitly and see uh, how many people click through um, on your link and get an idea of how popular it is. And again, the, that's the thing I really like about YouTube and other social media platforms for teaching is it gives you this great chance to get analytic data. And as a teacher, I want to know what kind of links are people clicking when I share them? What kind of pictures do people like? What kind of videos are valuable to my online students, my online learners. And I think as an educator, that's a, a great thing. So anyway, you can add that kind of stuff here. Um, and you can add links, uh, say some new new article comes out in the future that you want to make sure people are updated about, you can add updates here. Um, and, uh, and all of that. All right, let's talk about uh, analytics for a second. And there's there's a whole bunch of stuff to, to YouTube uh, that we won't go into in this video. But just to give you a brief idea, if you click the analytics tab, you can see all sorts of really, really fantastic. Um, oh, actually, I did that wrong. Let's go back to, um, stu to our channel videos here. Now on our channel, if you click the analytics tab, 
you can see all sorts of interesting content about your channel. So this is my information for my channel for the last month, basically. And you can see I've had 39,000 views, which is you know four over 4,000 hours of watch time. Um, and uh, I've picked up 676 new subscribers, and it, that's an increase from the previous month period. Um, I find that these numbers tend to go up anytime I release new videos. If I have a lull or I'm not releasing videos, I have months that I don't have quite as much performance. And you can go up here and you can change it and see, I want to see how I did over the last 90 days, for example. Or I want to see how I've done since I started my channel. And you can go all the way back. I started my channel way back here in 2012, uploaded a couple of videos over the next year, and didn't really do anything with it until I created the skin histology video right here in uh, 2016. And you can see that spike of activity. And then I think I did my basic derm path kind of compilation video. And then the channel really started to grow from there. And over time, and each of these numbers are right here. I uploaded five videos in this period, four videos there. So you can see that each time I end up um, uploading more videos, my activity starts growing um, at that point. All right. And uh, um, the other thing, so it's really nice. You can see that um, there's been, I got a little confused here because they used to report this in minutes of watch time, but I guess they've started doing hours. So my overall, if I look at the entire history of my channel, I've had 690,000 views and that equates to 85,000 hours of watch time. It's, I think um, over 5 million minutes last time I checked um, a, f a week ago, which is unbelievable. I just can't fathom it. And uh um, and obviously I have about 14,000 subscribers and you can see over the lifetime of the channel what my top videos are the most popular by far skin histology but then basic derm path derm path board review are, are coming up there and um, the other thing that's really meaningful to me as an educator is this little area here real-time activity this shows over the past 48 hours um, per hour how many views have, have I received on my videos and sometime um, I think towards the end of 2018, I noticed that every time I checked um, uh, my act, my real time activity, there were no empty hours. There were there was always a blue bar at every single hour of every single day. And so for the past probably about a year now, um, I'm recording this in uh, November 2019 as we speak. Um, for the for the past year, I checked this almost every day just because I'm curious. And there are almost always every hour of every day. Um, multiple views, usually 20 or more views of, of my videos. And so to me as an educator to know that while I'm sleeping, while I'm eating, while I'm hanging out with my wife or playing with my kids, I'm able to continue to teach from a video I uploaded online. That's priceless. That's the most powerful thing to me and why I really, really love YouTube because of, of that. All right. And you can see out of all these views, which of the videos are people watching and it basically it often overlaps with what I have uh, going on over here. So all of those analytics, and you can really go uh, into a lot more depth. You can uh, click uh, specifically to see the watch time and how that, that changed. You can look at your reach and uh, see where the traffic comes from, how people find your videos, um, how many people have seen uh, your video when scrolling through, how many people click on it, all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's really fantastic, um, the kinds of analytic uh detail that you can you can receive and surprisingly um, more than half of my viewers currently are actually non subscribers they're people that find the videos and oftentimes they find it either through YouTube suggesting the video to them you know like when you watch a YouTube video those little videos that pop up on the side you click on them right that's why YouTube works it's able to say oh hey do you want to watch this cat video and you're like oh yeah I think I will well, it's the same thing at once you start watching some pathology videos YouTube will start suggesting more pathology videos to you so I don't even have to really advertise my videos that much they just they get out there I mean obviously when I advertise and share them on social media because I have so many followers a lot more people come through to the videos that way and that's helped me to boost my uh, my um, a number of views and, and uh, subscribers but um, YouTube will do some of that for you um, and the more videos you make that are relevant the more those will get shared uh, so in any case, uh, that's really what I like about YouTube. And there's a whole lot of other settings and stuff here that we are not going to go into now. But that's the basics of how to upload the video and how to edit up the description. And then I'm going to show you next how to make a, a fancy thumbnail so that instead of this little screen capture here, which is fine, 
you get something that's prettier like that where you can actually use a nice white balance photo and you can upload a little label. And I think that people often click on videos based on what the thumbnail looks like. And so having a nice attractive thumbnail I think plays some role in, in helping people to click on them, the video and watch it. And also I just think it looks nice and, and um, it makes me feel happy about my channel and uh, with the, the work that I'm creating here. So I'm going to show you how to make those next. Okay, so to make um, nice thumbnails, I like this site. It's um, spark.adobe.com, and you just create a free account, or you can sign in with your Facebook or, or Google account. And the first time you use it, you can click the plus up here to uh, create a new project. And there's all sorts of stuff that you can do. If you scroll down, they've got all these templates, which is really nice. You just upload a picture, you type in what you want, um, pick a YouTube thumbnail, and it'll make um, a thumbnail that's the right size to fit on YouTube without getting cut off. So once you've been doing this a while, you can see that all the thumbnails for my YouTube videos, um, I've got all of them on here. So you can, uh, when you want to make a new one, you can pick one that you liked before if you had the format all set up, and you can uh, duplicate it and then uh, fill it in. So let's take uh, this one here, this EDV. Click the little triple dots here and say duplicate, and then you rename it. So I'm not going to do one about EDV. I'm going to actually do one about Caredoy Canthoma. And I always uh, try to label them YouTube thumbnail. That way, once I save the file, it's easier for me to search in my files for thumbnail or YouTube and find the image later if I need it. So here it is. Now it's uh, here. So if we click on it, on Edit Project, so you can see it's pulled up the thumbnail. So uh, click on the background photo right there. I just click there. And then up here, click on the uh, little photo icon that says Replace. And then Upload Photo. And then you go select the photo you want. In this case, I'm going to use a, a Caredoy Canthoma um, image that I've got. That's from my uh, Derm Path Survival Guide book. And I've got it all white balanced and looking pretty. Right, so now the picture's uploaded. And you can just drag the picture around with your mouse here. You can move it up or down or to side to side. You can also uh, rotate it if you want. And um, it's really nice. It's uh, in, in uh, You can zoom in or zoom out. So it's quite easy. Um, and in, in fact, it's a lot easier, I think, than using Photoshop. Photoshop's very powerful, but uh, really difficult to learn, in my opinion. So, um, so I like that. And then I just have to decide how do I want to put my words on here. So you can play around um, a lot of different ways. I think in this one, because the Caraway Canthum is so pretty, I think I'll just uh, delete the bar here. I'll delete that. And I'll click on the, the bar and delete the color. And you can see over here, you can change the colors, the different things. It's pretty cool but we're going to just delete it in this case and leave the words. And then clicking on the words, you can go over and you can select from a whole bunch of different sizes and fonts and everything. I like this font personally, so I'll double click it. And I'm going to change that to say Carado Acantho. So I'll just bring it up here. drag the corner down to resize it. And remember, this is going to be a small thumbnail, so you want to make sure your text is big enough. Um, and the idea is to make it a, a nice, catchy looking image with um, a word or words that will make it easy for someone to see um, from low power, so to speak, when it's on uh, the YouTube thumbnail, that uh, this is the video uh, about something that they want to watch. OK, so there we go. So we've got that done. And then now I just click uh, um, up here once you're happy with it. And it will leave a little um, a little watermark here. If you want, you can pay money to have it removed. But I feel like it's so small and unobtrusive that I've been fine just leaving that watermark. So click Download. And then you save the file as a JPEG or a PNG or whatever. So I usually will save as a JPEG. And then after I do that, I'll switch over to my YouTube channel. And I've got my Carrot Away Can't a video here. And down at the bottom, it says Upload Thumbnail. So click that, and it will replace it with the new thumbnail you just made and then save it and then you're ready to go.